Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling Podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pamela Rickia, and this is episode number 236 of the podcast. It's the 28th of July, 2020, as I record this intro. And this week, I'm sharing part five of the audiobook edition of my book, The Unschooling Journey, A Field Guide. Inspired by Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey framework, The Unschooling Journey is a weave of myths, contemporary stories, and tales from my journey. It's not a how-to book. No two paths through the world of unschooling have the same twists and turns, yet having a general sense of where you are on your journey can bring valuable insight as you navigate the challenges that will inevitably appear. I share this book as a field guide to the stages and characters you are likely to encounter in some form on your unschooling journey. And I am really happy to be sharing the book on the podcast as I record the audiobook edition. Thank you so much for being my beta listeners. If you've heard an edit that we've missed or a spot where something didn't sound right, I'd love to know. You can comment on the show notes page on my website or shoot me an email, pam at livingjoyfully.ca. With just one more episode to go next week, I hope you're finding this deep dive into the unschooling journey through the lens of the hero's journey interesting. So last week, we covered stages eight and nine. And while our de-schooling journey to that point had been working through much of the nuts and bolts of unschooling, the hands-on details of living unschooling day to day, in stages eight and nine, we began to dive into the personal growth and transformation aspects of our journey. So in stage eight, accepting the value of all experiences, we come to recognize the connections between the ups and downs of life and truly understand that we gain valuable insights from both kinds of moments. Judging them as good or bad adds no value. In fact, it can get in the way of real valuable learning and it hits us. Life isn't about trying to avoid the bad moments so we can finally live our good lives. We've been living our full lives all along. And in stage nine, accepting our nature, we do battle with the idea of temptation. We learn to accept rather than fight our nature, to accept all facets of ourselves, confident, fearful, tempted, and no longer judge them as good and bad, but to see and accept them all as part of our nature. We move beyond judging ourselves so that we can mindfully move through these moments of temptation, learn what we can, release what isn't working, and continue on our journey. And this week, we're covering stages 10, 11, and 12 to reach the holy grail of our quest, unschooling with confidence and grace. And for listeners who prefer interview-style episodes, this week I've selected episode 37, 10 Questions with Carol Black, which was first released in September of 2016. Carol unschooled her two daughters after dropping out of a teacher education program, which was sparked by reading John Holt's How Children Fail. She has written some wonderfully insightful essays about unschooling, which you can read on her website, carolblack.org, and she directed the fascinating documentary film Schooling the World, which we talk about in the episode. You'll find the link to the episode in the show notes, or just search your favorite podcast app for episode number 37. As a personal update, Liz is coming this weekend to visit for a good chunk of August, so I have been having a lot of fun getting organized for that. We haven't seen her since Christmas, so we are very excited. And I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons, Roanne Kozakowski and Deanna Ayala. Hi, Roanne. Hi, Deanna. (laughs) I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support not only lets me know that you enjoy the show and want it to continue, it allows me to spend time creating new episodes each week and to keep the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. 
If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's dive into part five of my book, The Unschooling Journey, A Field Guide. Stage 10, Accepting Others Where They Are. Seeing ourselves in others. Stop for a moment and take a deep breath. Maybe two. Are you ready to forge ahead? All the work we've done on our journey so far has prepared us for this stage. We will need all our wits about us as we probe the remaining power imbalance in our lives. We have big questions to ask ourselves. Who still holds power over us? How? Why? Where does it come from? Why do we continue to engage with them on the seesaw of resisting their power and seeking their approval? Do you see how those two ideas live on the same continuum? We resist their control in our lives. We want to make our own choices. On the other hand, we desperately want their approval. Even though we suspect it's futile, we catch ourselves needing to convince them that we are right that our unschooling choice is a good one. If we could just find the right thing to say that will persuade them. But deep down, we know that the only path to their approval is to do what they want us to do. And each time we remember this, it spurs us to again resist their power over us. The seesaw goes up and down, up and down. This is the ride we've lived on, probably since the start of our journey, but now we're ready to find the exit. Though it may not be the way we expect. Campbell calls this stage atonement with the father. This authority figure represents whatever the hero, and that's you, sees as the ultimate power in their life. Who or what has the power to make you feel small? As you contemplate that, Think back to stage four when we were crossing the threshold to the world of unschooling. I asked you to remember whose voice you heard in your head as you read through the typical conversation with a threshold guardian. That voice may be a clue to who continues to hold sway over you. The need to be right. To explore this stage, we're going to look at both ends of this power-based seesaw. On one end are the times when we are feeling reasonably self-assured as we engage with others. We can resist their attempts to exert power over us. We feel confident that our choices are good ones. And at some point, after trying to help a friend with a challenge, I imagine most of us have thought, or maybe even said, if only they'd listen to me, their life would be so much easier. Maybe followed by a sigh or a slight shake of the head. It's not usually said with any particular malice. We are earnestly sharing our advice, hoping they'll take it. We are confident it will work for them because if we found ourselves in that situation, those are the actions we'd take and they'd most likely work out well for us. But something interesting happened when I found myself in that moment and chose to dig deeper. I asked myself why the person was so resistant. Why didn't my suggestions make sense to them? They certainly made sense to me. And then it eventually hit me. Yes, I was seeing the situation clearly, but through my personal filters. I was assuming that those choices would be best for the other person too. But human beings aren't interchangeable clones. We cannot feel the signals from someone else's body their relaxed or racing heart, the hair raising on the back of their neck in awe or fear, or the adrenaline pumping with excitement. We can't know the memories being triggered from last week or from a decade ago. We can't know the goals that lie deep in their heart yet to be shared with anyone. And again, I discovered these bigger picture insights about life through watching my children's unschooling lives unfold. I saw them making choices that, looking through their eyes, were clearly wonderfully perfect choices for them. But when I put myself in their shoes, 
I would never have made the same choices. It's such a subtle but essential shift in perspective. I came to see the profound difference between putting myself in another person's shoes and thinking about what I would do and seeing a situation through their eyes and contemplating what they might want to do. There are probably as many different workable paths forward as there are people involved in a given situation. As I began letting go of thinking I knew better than others about their own lives, the need to convince them to do things my way, quote, for their own good, faded. Pretty soon, the idea of judging someone else's choices as right or wrong, or telling them in no uncertain terms what they should do in a situation, felt very uncomfortable. This often also translates to another level of release and trust with our children. Remember those deeper levels of understanding we reach with time and experience? But here's where we can sometimes flounder. When we no longer feel the need to get in the middle of things and exert some control over the situation, we sometimes step too far away from their lives and risk becoming disconnected. Yes, it's not about unduly influencing, controlling our children's choices, but it's also not about leaving them to figure things out on their own. We are an integral part of their journey. Life is the dance of everything in between. I was still involved in their days. I chose my next steps, backward, forward, to the side, in response to their steps and to the nuance of the moment. Was the music picking up or slowing down? Was it time to follow or lead? I could commiserate with those involved, sometimes sharing my thoughts and the subtleties of the situation as I saw them, as well as brainstorm possibilities and any pros and cons I envisioned from their perspective. And if asked, I could even share what I'd probably do in similar circumstances. I no longer felt the need to attach any expectations to the outcome. Nor would I feel slighted if they chose a different path forward because I knew, in that case, there were probably pieces of the puzzle I was missing. Maybe even that everyone was missing. We do our best in the moment and see what happens. And because this way of engaging with my children felt so right and made so much sense, soon I was treating the adults in my life the same way. I didn't know better than they did what they needed. If asked, I could share what I saw, even brainstorm ideas with them, but I could leave it there. Their choices weren't about me at all. The need for approval. So where does this release of attachment to others' choices and outcomes lead us? Well, Now we have a new perspective on things as we dig even deeper and come face to face with our authority figure. We soon realize that the one whose approval we have been seeking is also seeing situations through their filters. Interesting. Now we better understand why they are so sure their way is the right way. Chances are they are putting themselves in our shoes rather than looking at the situation from our perspective, through our eyes and our circumstances. With that understanding, we come to realize that their suggestions say more about where they are on their journey than they do about where we are on ours. As that revelation solidifies, the impact of their judgmental pronouncements fades. It's not really about us at all. Soon, their comments sail right past us rather than hitting us in the solar plexus. Power struggles dissolve because we no longer feel defensive, nor do we feel the need to rush them along on their journey. Instead, we can meet them where they are. We realize their path may be different than ours. The need for their approval slowly evaporates. They will get there in their own time. Or not. At the same time, we are very comfortable with our choices, and now that seems to be enough. We finally step off the seesaw. Accepting others where they are. My authority figure, the one whose power to judge and shame me held out the longest, 
was not an individual, but society. My parents, while they didn't particularly understand unschooling, weren't against it. Sometimes they asked questions and we would chat, but it wasn't confrontational. I felt their trust. What did manage to make me feel unworthy and defensive for the longest time were the pointed glances of passing acquaintances, usually in group situations. People who knew my kids didn't go to school, but knew little about us. It was clear they thought I was foolish. Before going into these group situations, I would give myself a bit of a pep talk, reminding myself that they knew little about our lives and that unschooling was working well for us. Even after countless internal pep talks, I still felt uneasy. And the memory of when that changed is still fresh so many years later. It was a clear turning point for me, though I didn't realize it was this particular turning point until I dived into Campbell's work. We were in a school gym, and I and a dozen or so other moms were huddled around the Girl Guide troop leader. It was a few days before Lissy's first overnight camp, and the leader was explaining the camp rules. She also had a couple of questions for us. Do you give me permission to let your daughter call you from camp? And can she ask to be picked up? All the other moms said, no, my daughter has to stay for the whole camp, and no, she can't call home. The relief was palpable in some of their voices. They were plainly grateful for the opportunity to pass on to someone else the responsibility of saying no to their daughters, preemptively avoiding any guilt-inducing phone calls home. We all knew that bringing a child home early would be seen by the other moms as a parenting failure. A bit unexpectedly, I felt a connection with them because I well knew that pulse-quickening moment when the possibility of impending judgment pops up and the anxious wish to avoid the resulting shame. When it was my turn, I just said, Sure, she can call me, and yes, I'll come get her if she wants. In my mind, I knew I didn't want her to feel left alone to fend for herself if she decided she wanted my help. I recall that, despite feeling a connection with some of the other moms, I was a bit surprised that nobody else said yes. But this time, I didn't feel like their answers were wrong. I do remember feeling very comfortable with my answer, and the fact that it would probably be perceived as a failure on my part by the other moms didn't faze me at all. I distinctly remember the dawning realization that I felt no need to apologize for my choice, nor to explain it. It was just the best choice for us, and I was happy to take full responsibility for it. It felt refreshing, relaxing, peaceful even. I saw everyone making the choice they wanted. And I didn't need to know how the weekend played out for other families because it didn't matter. Those were their lives to learn from, not mine to meddle or judge. How could I know the nuances at play in their lives? As for us, Lissy called, and I picked her up at midnight. It turned out to be a wonderful bonding moment. She was grateful when I arrived and, with another example that I would happily be there to support her choices, her trust in me grew. We had a lovely conversation on the way home. She slept in her bed, feeling safe and cared for. As I imagined, so did the girls that were excited to stay at camp. Next time there was a camp, Lissy chose to go. I answered the questions the same way. She didn't call. I would have gone if she did. We are all on the same journey, creating our unique paths as we make the choices that feel best for us in the moment. Our choices play out however they do, and we can learn from them, or not. In that moment, I deeply felt what Campbell calls the at one of this atonement stage. I no longer felt they had any power over me, and my internal struggles faded. In fact, I felt empowered to go against the rules and norms of conventional society and take full responsibility for doing so. I no longer felt I had to hide my actions to protect myself. I felt more fully myself than I had in a long time. Simba chooses to take his place in the circle of life.
In the story of The Lion King, a Disney movie released in 1994, there is a beautiful scene depicting this stage of atonement with the father. Here's a quick summary of the story leading up to that scene to get us situated. I'm sure by now you'll recognize some of the earlier stages of Simba's journey. As a cub, Simba was tricked by his uncle, Scar, into thinking he was responsible for the death of his beloved father, Mufasa, king of the Pride Lands. Immediately after, Scar convinces Simba to run away and sends his hyenas to follow and kill him and takes over as a new king. Escaping the hyenas, Simba arrives in his new world and finds allies in Timon and Pumbaa, who teach him all about their Hakuna Matata lifestyle. Time passes, and now an adult, Simba runs into his childhood best friend, Nala. She explains that Scar has let the hyenas take over the Pride Lands, and they are now desolate. She urges him to return home and take his rightful place as king. Simba, still believing he caused his father's death, feels too ashamed to consider returning home to his social community, his pride. A great name for a group of lions. And now we have the scene where everything changes for Simba. He meets Rafiki, a mentor figure, who tells Simba that his father is still alive in him. How much more at one with your father can you get than seeing your father's face in yours as you gaze at your reflection in the water? Mufasa's ghost then appears in the sky and he speaks with Simba, imploring him to remember who he is and to take his place in the circle of life. Simba is clearly deeply moved by the encounter, seeing that his father wants him to assume his role even after all that's happened and feeling that kinship, that oneness with his father. When Rafiki reappears, Simba remarks that the winds are changing. Rafiki says, change is good. And Simba replies, yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do. But going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Change is not easy, but Simba is now ready to rejoin his community. He understands that they may judge him negatively, but now he can accept that and them. He no longer fears them because now he understands who he is and he's ready to be himself everywhere. Showing up openly. It was a powerful scene, and watching it now, the similarities with my own moment of revelation are striking. For years, Simba resisted returning to his community because he was ashamed of his role in his father's death. I resisted openly engaging with my community because I felt the roller coaster of shame in their obvious disdain for my family's choice not to send our kids to school. But both Simba and I met a moment when that resistance faded. We understood now that they were people on their own journeys, making their own choices, just as we were. And we were no longer ashamed to show up openly as ourselves, mistakes and all, doing our best. Over the last three stages, we've undergone some profound transformations, and together they formed a sequence of ever-deepening acceptance. First, we moved beyond the desire to judge situations as good or bad, right or wrong, and accepted the value of all experiences. Next, we moved beyond judging ourselves, accepting our nature, so we can more gracefully move through the inevitable moments of temptation we will continue to encounter. And, in this last stage, We moved beyond resistance and shame stemming from other people's judgment of us, and conversely, the need to judge them, to become comfortable accepting them where they are on their own journey. As our need for the approval of the remaining authority figure fades, so does the last of our power struggles. As we continue to embrace this new level of self-awareness, We no longer feel the need to hide or apologize for our choices, nor are we drawn to flaunt them. We just live them. In the end, we realize that we hold the ultimate power in our life, and only in our life. 
Stage 11, Cultivating Kindness and Compassion. Finding the Magic in the Mess. Joseph Campbell calls this stage apotheosis, rising to the rank of a god. In other words, reaching our highest level. For example, we might say a particular movie was the apotheosis of an actor's career. On the hero's journey, this stage describes when the hero moves beyond the last pockets of ignorance and reaches a divine state. As we contemplate what we've learned about judgment, temptation, and power over the last three stages of our journey, our understanding continues to grow, and in this stage, we glimpse the true nature of life we discover the wholeness that generously encompasses both poles of opposites. Yes and no, right and wrong, good and bad, birth and death, time and eternity, us and them, yin and yang. Yin and yang. In Chinese philosophy, yin and yang describe how seemingly opposite forces are actually interconnected and complementary. Yin represents the dark, passive, feminine side, while Yang is the light, active, masculine side. In Chinese mythology, Yin and Yang were born out of chaos, such as in the creation story of Panku, or Pengu. One version begins with a cosmic egg floating in the void containing the chaos energy of the universe. In fact, many cultures have creation myths that begin with some version of a cosmic egg. Panku evolved inside an enormous cosmic egg, growing 10 feet each day. As he grew, he gradually separated the forces of nature into their opposites, earth, yin, and sky, yang, light, yang, and dark, yin, wet, yin, and dry, yang, male, yang, and female, yin, and so on. After 18,000 years, he was fully grown and the separation was complete. The egg hatched and Panku died. His eyes became the sun and the moon. His body became the features of the earth. His sweat became the water and the tiny fleas on his body became people. The modern yin-yang symbol represents how these complementary opposites yin black and yang white, energetically swirl together. One waxes while the other wanes, each in turn reaching their fullest expression while the seed of its opposite dwells deep in its core. They are mutually dependent on each other, forever shifting, but together an indivisible whole. Neither is superior The dynamic tension and flow between them expresses the cosmic harmony of the universe, two aspects of one reality. This reminds us that there is a duality in all things and that there is value at every point in between polar opposites. That fits so well with much of what we've discussed on our journey, doesn't it? The spectrum of possibilities that lie between yes and no. The learning about the world and ourselves that happens whether things turn out good or bad. Neither result is superior. It is all valuable experience. When we, we and our children, are choosing our actions and learning from our experiences, we grow into the people that we want to be. There is value and learning in all states, and the yin-yang symbol expresses this beautifully. Unity and Duality in Story Remember, story is to humans as water is to fish. It is instinctual. A well-told story needs a sense of oneness, of unity, which is expressed through its theme, its one overarching idea. Yet, a good story also needs an aspect of duality, the push and pull of opposites that add tension and movement. Christopher Vogler explains this well in his book, The Writer's Journey. Quote, As soon as you choose a single thought or character to unite your story, you have automatically generated its polar opposite, a contrary concept or antagonistic character, and therefore a duality or polarized system that conducts energy between the two parties. Unity begets duality. 
the existence of one implies the possibility of two. End quote. Panku split the cosmic energy to create a world of opposites, yet we need one to define the other. You can't have wet without dry, light without dark, up without down, trust without suspicion, forgiveness without revenge. And in story, as in life, change is constant. That waxing and waning flow of energy between the poles makes for great stories because it connects to us on a deep level. It is an expression of human nature. Even if we can't name it, we can feel it. A satisfying story connects with us on an instinctual level. Approaching the summit. What about our unschooling story? We've explored opposites extensively and come to understand the overarching unity that encompasses them both. How do we bring this sense of oneness into our days? As we begin to actively embrace this wholeness rather than its parts, we experience the reality of living and learning in connection with our children more deeply and truly than we have before. As we continue to heal from our past, old fears and hurts fall away and their influence on our choices fades. As that weight lifts, we feel lighter and more open, able to find more creative and fun ways to navigate our days. As our self-awareness grows, we bring more of our true selves into our days. And as we learn more about our children, our connection with them deepens and our trust grows. These revelations feed off each other, bringing an increasing lightness and depth to our days. And in time, we realize we are approaching the summit of our journey, our apotheosis. When we look at others, in and out of our family, we see that they are on their own journeys, just as we are. From this vantage point, we see others as an integral part of the wholeness of our lives, and that we are an integral part of theirs. We see the whole of the yin-yang symbol without favoring black or white. Our sense of otherness, of us versus them, fades. We are all human beings. We feel a growing sense of oneness, a kinship with humanity. Kindness and Compassion A few stages ago, we talked about shifting our relationships with our children from control to connection, and we began not only putting ourselves in our children's shoes, but also seeing the world through their eyes, and not just their outer world, but their inner world too, and meeting them where they are. That ability to empathize with others, along with our growing sense of kinship with humanity, creates a rich soil in which kindness and compassion now begin to flourish. When we see ourselves in others, we can more easily choose to treat them and ourselves with kindness and compassion. When Lissy was in her early teens, she came across a quote that struck her deeply. Quote, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle, end quote. One day we were chatting about decorating the basement, and she wanted to put that quote up somewhere. I picked up some large sticky note letters, and we put the saying up on a wall, placing the words around a window frame. It's still there. Over the years, it's been a touchstone for me, a reminder when I pass it to take the time to see things from the other person's perspective. This was an insight that my children regularly brought me back to. There were times when I felt my children were wronged in some big or small way by another child. Yet when we started chatting about it, the conversation would sometimes go in a very different direction than I anticipated. They knew the other child better than I did and would explain their actions with an understanding of the other child's circumstances and personality that would sometimes take my breath away. More instances where giving space to our conversations and letting my children direct the flow led to more learning and growing for me. The small daily battles, the larger life-changing battles, all the questions and choices that appear on our plates each day, everyone has them. And no matter their family circumstances, their parenting styles, or what you think about their challenges, they are big and meaningful to them. 
They are the tricksters, monsters, and obstacles that are part of their life's journey, and they are making choices that make the most sense to them. What they learn from these encounters is not under our control. Those moms I mentioned in the last stage who chose to insist their daughters stay at camp, when we ran into each other at meetings in the future, I smiled at them with kindness. I nodded my head compassionately in conversation as they shared their frustrations with school or with their children. Acknowledging their truth in that moment does not say I would take the same actions. It says, I hear you. And in my experience, when people feel heard, when they are heard and acknowledged with kindness and compassion, sometimes there's this wonderful shift in their body language from tension to openness, and the conversation takes a step deeper. Maybe they ask, what would you do? And I can share a perspective that is more child-centered. With no expectation that it will be a sweeping revelation for them or that they change their path. It's just a seed planted. A Policy of Kindness is an anthology of writings by and about the Dalai Lama. And in a talk titled Kindness and Compassion, he shared, quote, This is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. The philosophy is kindness, end quote. He explained that while we've made startling advances in science and technology that have led to incredible levels of external progress, our internal progress has not kept up. As human beings, we all want happiness and peace of mind, but we cannot achieve that through anger. The blueprint lies in our mind, where we choose our actions. And it is through choosing kindness, love, and compassion that an individual can achieve peace of mind. This peace of mind infuses their personal relationships, resulting in a peaceful family. More and more peaceful families can eventually bring this perspective to the national level, and then ultimately the international level, the stage on which the Dalai Lama speaks. But for us, on our unschooling journey, we are taking that inner journey of the mind and spirit, exploring and discovering how human beings are wired to learn and grow and interact with one another regardless of age. We are creating our blueprint. And what we learn through unschooling with our children applies not only to ourselves, but also to people at large, to humanity. Finding the magic in the mess. Of course, none of this means our lives are easy or perfect. There are messy kitchens, diverging needs, sibling arguments, lack of sleep, and big disappointments. Not to mention finding time for a shower. It's life in all its glory. In my experience, so often when we choose to reach for kindness and compassion in the moment, we discover magic. The moment turns, and we find ourselves going places more interesting, more fun, and more meaningful than we could have predicted or even imagined. At first, it took a leap of faith to do it. When things feel out of control, every fiber of our being wants to rein things back under our control. But after a few times of managing to reach for kindness, I saw the beauty and magic of releasing that desire for control. And eventually, it became easier. One story I recall fondly, happened in the aftermath of a big January snowstorm. Lissy was maybe 13 or 14, and we had tickets to see a concert in the city about an hour away. That morning, the snow was falling heavily, and I was sure they would cancel the show. People were being told to stay home if possible. I was looking forward to settling in and hanging around the fire. Lissy had been looking forward to the show and was understandably disappointed. I told her that I was pretty sure they'd reschedule the show so she wouldn't miss it. It would just be postponed. She kept checking the website, and by early afternoon, they announced that the show was going to go on. Lissy wanted to go, and I wanted to stay home. I imagined all the hurdles in our way, and it seemed like way too much work. But I saw her suffering, and I chose to react with compassion. 
And though I couldn't yet muster a, yes, let's go, I did manage to take a small step to meet her with maybe. Though the snow had stopped falling, I explained the obstacles I saw and that I was willing to try the next step and see how it looked. If it looked okay, we'd try the next step and the next. She agreed. Step one, clean off the car and shovel enough of the driveway to get out by our planned departure time. We did it. Even after the snowplow went by and created another curb of snow at the end of the driveway. Step two, is our local rural road plowed and safely drivable? That was a yes too. Step three, pack the car with extra hats and mitts and snacks in case we get stuck along the way. Done. By the time we pulled out of the driveway, it felt like we were on quite the adventure. I was rather surprised we'd actually made it this far, but there was no point that said stop, so we kept going. Step four, I reminded Lissy as we slowly drove into the city that if the roads or the traffic got bad, we'd turn back. Even in her excitement, she was fine with that. Turned out, though the roads were snow-covered, they had been plowed, so it wasn't deep and traffic was light. Slowly but surely, we made our way into the city. Step five, we pulled into the venue parking lot. We were both so surprised to find ourselves there. It was almost surreal, so white and quiet outside. And inside, the concert turned out to be a very intimate show. The band thanked those who showed up and really connected with the audience as they played. It ended up being a pretty magical night. Time and again, I've discovered that when things get messy, making an effort to reach for kindness and compassion pays dividends far beyond my investment. I have so many similar stories. As you reach the summit of this stage, I suspect you will discover that when things are feeling off, there's no longer that fear-inspired adrenaline rush pushing you to grab control or to quickly blame someone else. Instead, you'll use your discomfort as a clue that you're probably missing a piece of the puzzle. Maybe it's more information about the situation or a better understanding of your children's perspective on it, their goal, their motivation, their understanding, and so forth. It doesn't mean ignoring your discomfort, rather learning to get to the root of it. Our lives are a dance of people sharing their needs and wants and motivations and doing what we can to help each other meet them. Though sparked by our unschooling journey, this fundamental shift in perspective becomes a part of us, applicable to our whole lives, not just the unschooling bits. In fact, it's around this point that you may realize that there are no separate unschooling bits. Unschooling is life in all its messy beautifulness. And more and more often, we find ourselves living in wholeness, with kindness and compassion. Stage 12, Unschooling with Confidence and Grace. Unschooling is a practice. As we crest the mountaintop, we obtain the holy grail of our quest. We are truly and deeply unschooling. This is what we set out to accomplish when we first answered the call to adventure. What we probably didn't realize back then was how winding and intense our journey was going to turn out to be. But as we survey the view from the summit, we know it was worth every step. Our relationships with our children are steeped in connection and trust. We dance with them, sometimes leading, sometimes following, and sometimes even stepping on each other's toes. But we regroup and soon find our rhythm again. We are confidently living and learning together as a family. We trust the process of unschooling, now understanding that it is as simple and as challenging as living life. We are following our curiosity, developing our self-awareness, and pursuing our short and long-term goals. We are mindfully engaged in our days with all their ups and downs and twists and turns, but now they are framed by the good-humored joy we find in the everyday moments. We've come to appreciate the beauty of the simplest moments, cuddling with our children on the couch watching a favorite movie, 
walking in the park, our kids darting from flower to flower. Henny is the perfect rock to hold so they can add it to their collection when we get home. Watching our child enthusiastically turn on the water to show us how it flows over the complicated contraption of pots and plates they've built in the sink. Laying in bed together, reading a story out loud to them as their eyes blink heavily. These moments bring us deep joy and contentment. We know the power they hold. The Elixir of Grace Campbell calls this stage the ultimate boon, and in myths and stories, the reward at the end of the journey is often represented by an object. Fire, magical trinkets, priceless treasure, and elixirs of health or immortality. But after the trials and dreams of the journey, the real reward isn't material. We have journeyed to attain the grace of the gods and goddesses. Not to steal it from them, nor to trick them into giving it to us. It's not a fixed commodity. But to come to understand, and therefore share, their perspective and their spirit. Their grace. The goal is not to become a god or goddess-like being. On our journey, we've learned to accept our human nature, to live mindfully in the moment, and not get caught up chasing some embodiment of perfection. There is no perfect model of unschooling. Day to day, it looks different for everyone. But the principles of unschooling, the spirit with which unschooling is lived, is fundamentally the same. And that is what we've explored and absorbed on our journey. Campbell describes our reward as the elixir of imperishable being, but it's not about immortality. The real prize the hero has gained is the knowledge of their indestructibility in life. It's that understanding deep in our bones that enables us to move through whatever challenges life throws at us. Grace is the kindness and compassion that comes from knowing that we will endure, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel even if we can't quite see it yet. It's not a case of thinking that when distressing things happen, it's for our own good or that we deserve them. We don't feel the need to place blame, which adds a distorting filter to many situations. Hence, we see distressing events more clearly, more gracefully, and treat everyone involved kinder and more compassionately as we move through them. Our journey starts out focused on our children and ends up being a boon for ourselves, one that fully includes our children in its embrace. It has also grown beyond unschooling into the realm of life. The Story of Psyche and Eros The Greek myth of Psyche and Eros connects beautifully with the de-schooling phase of our journey. Psyche is the Greek word for breath or soul, And in this story, Psyche is the personification of the soul. As we wrap up this phase, we recognize that much of our work here has been inner work, engaging deeply with our soul and exploring what it means to be human. Psyche was a mortal born to a king and queen, the youngest and the most beautiful of their three daughters. She was so beautiful that admirers began worshipping her rather than Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. When Aphrodite caught wind of this, she was not pleased. She dispatched her son Eros, god of love and desire, with orders to prick Psyche with one of his arrows and ensure she falls in love with a loathsome creature. But just as he sees her, Eros accidentally pricks himself and immediately falls in love with her. He decides to take her as his bride and whisks her away to a beautiful house in a lovely valley. Psyche finds herself in paradise with a god for a husband, and she can have anything she wishes but with one restriction. She may not look at him nor ask anything about him. Each night he comes to her through the window, makes love to her, and leaves before morning. Psyche's two older sisters, having heard she has married a god and lives in paradise, are incredibly jealous and keep asking to visit. Eventually, Eros agrees, and Psyche invites them. Filled with envy, they concoct a plan to break up the couple. 
They tell Psyche that her husband is actually a loathsome creature who will kill her, and they advise her to hide a lamp and a knife in the bedroom, and when he's asleep, use the lamp to see his true form and the knife to kill him. Psyche is taken in by their story and follows their instructions. Sound familiar? On our journey, the sisters represent those nagging voices, the ones in our heads replaying the conventional messages we've grown up with, as well as the ones in our lives trying to scare us into abandoning our journey. That night, Psyche uncovers the lamp and sees her husband for the first time. She discovers he is the god of love. In her shock, she accidentally pricks herself with one of his arrows and falls in love with him. In the commotion, a drop of hot oil from the lamp falls on Eros and awakens him. When he sees what has happened, he takes flight out the window, Psyche grabbing hold of him. It's not long, though, before she loses her grip and falls to the ground. Eros lands nearby and tells her that she has broken her promise and their paradise has been destroyed. He flies away. Psyche is devastated and consumed by love, sets out on a quest to find Eros. Eventually, she goes to Aphrodite's temple to pray for help. Aphrodite appears and, still jealous, gives her four difficult tasks to complete. For the first task, Aphrodite takes Psyche to a room with a huge pile of mixed grains and insists she have them all sorted by morning. Psyche is overwhelmed and sees no way that she can complete the task on time. This task reminds me of when I first crossed the threshold into the world of unschooling, that feeling of being overwhelmed with all my questions, not knowing which to pursue first. But really, all we can do is get started. Pick one question, one grain, anyone, and sort it out. Then the next one, and the next. Soon, ants appear and begin to help Psyche sort the greens, their industriousness a shining example of doing one thing at a time. When Aphrodite returns the next morning, she is surprised to see the task completed and quickly assigns the second task, gathering golden fleece from the rams. When Psyche arrives, the rams are running around the field, butting heads, competing with one another. She's sure she'll be trampled if she tries to enter the field and grab some fleece. Sitting by the river, thinking, she receives some helpful wisdom from a reed. Bide her time. Wait until the sun goes down and they tire of their games. Then you can collect what you need from the fleece that has gathered on the tree branches through their rough play. Through this task, Psyche learns to listen to her own rhythms, her soul, rather than getting caught up and pulled along in the power of the moment to take the time to figure out a path forward that both meets her goal and honors her inner self. The third task Aphrodite assigns is to fill a crystal goblet with water from a stream that flows to and from the river Styx. It is carved into the side of a mountain, flowing from the top of a cliff to the depths of Hades and rising back up through a spring. As the water hisses and monsters warn her away, Psyche despairs again, seeing no way to approach the stream's edge. With this task, she receives help from Zeus's eagle. The eagle takes the goblet in his talon, flies to the middle of the stream, fills it, and brings it safely back to her. What the eagle brings is a new and wider perspective on the situation. In his book, She, Understanding Feminine Psychology, Robert A. Johnson explores the myth of Psyche and Eros in depth and shares his thoughts about what Psyche learns through this task. Quote, The earthbound individual may look down into the crashing, swirling confusion and feel that there is no way to sort it all out. From this narrow point of view, she cannot see clearly enough to have a workable perspective. It is at this moment that she needs her eagle vision, which has a much broader perspective and can see the great flow of life. End quote. We, too, have done a lot of work on our journey to see this broader perspective. Finally reaching the summit, we discovered the bigger picture view that encompasses the full spectrum of opposite energies and came to appreciate how they weave together in the great flow of life. 
And now, Psyche joins us in the final stage of this phase of our journeys. Aphrodite, incensed that Psyche has made it this far, assigns the fourth and final task. Go to Hades, fill a container with beauty ointment from Persephone, the goddess of the underworld, and return with it. This is a seemingly impossible task for a mortal, and again she despairs. This is a common human experience when faced with yet another challenge. In the end, Psyche chooses to continue. Knowing she needs to die to enter the underworld, she climbs the highest tower she can find with the intention of throwing herself off. At the last moment, the tower itself gives her the information she needs to complete her task. First, she is given directions to a hidden spot to find a pathless way to the underworld. Take two coins with you for the ferryman and two barley cakes for the three-headed dog. Then the tower warns her, you will be asked for help three times, but you must refuse. Psyche gathers the coins and the cakes and finds the pathless path. When she comes to the river Styx, she gives one of the coins to the ferryman to take her across. Three times she is asked by pitiful creatures to stop and help, but remembering the tower's words, she does not stop. When we understand our goal and ourselves, sometimes we don't have the additional energy to be able to help others, and that's okay. At the entrance to the underworld, she tosses one of the barley cakes to Cerberus, the guardian of Hades. As the dog's three heads fight over it, Psyche passes. Having finally made it, she meets with Persephone and asks her to fill the container with beauty ointment, which she does without question. Reward in hand, Psyche retraces her steps to return to the upper world. The second cake for Cerberus, the second coin for the ferryman. At last, she is back in the sun with her precious reward. The reward isn't the end of the story, though. The tower had reminded Psyche to never look in the box, but on her way to her final meeting with Aphrodite, Psyche succumbs to temptation. Wanting to be beautiful, when she was finally reunited with her beloved Eros, she opens the box. Looking inside, she sees nothing, but she immediately falls to the ground in an everlasting sleep. Some mysteries are meant only for the gods. Remember, having grace doesn't mean that we are perfect. There will be challenges that seem insurmountable. There will be temptations. In fact, understanding that we aren't perfect is an integral part of the journey to grace. But in this story, love triumphs in the end. Eros escapes his mother, finds Psyche, and wipes the everlasting sleep from her eyes and back into the box. Psyche presents the container to Aphrodite, and Eros receives Zeus's blessing to marry Psyche, making her immortal. Grace in the Everyday just as Psyche was swayed by temptation, even after receiving her ultimate reward, reaching this stage is not a permanent state of being, but it is now one that we've experienced, which means it sits within reach. Our lives are not static, and we continue to learn and grow and change. Therefore, we need to continue to do the work to maintain our self-awareness. The people in our lives continue to learn and grow and change, so we need to stay in tune with the rhythm of our relationships. What does this look like day to day? Most days, it looks like family members confidently pursuing learning in any of its forms, including more formal classrooms, without getting caught up in the trappings of the system. We choose to participate in the environment and take from the experience what we are interested in, we evaluate the experience against our personal goals, which often include more than just grades. When I'm stymied trying to figure out how to come up with a plan that meets the needs of everyone involved, it looks like me openly asking my children for their suggestions, knowing they too will consider everyone's needs. They are full members of the family, and they often have a fresh perspective and some pretty great ideas. Unschooling, life, is a practice. Each day, each moment, we can choose to reach for love, kindness, and compassion, to live gracefully with others. 
I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the wonderful archive of earlier podcast episodes. The conversations never go out of date. And you can find more information about my books, my Patreon community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit at my website, livingjoyfully.ca. Have a great day. 